Amen. Alleluia. Thank you, Jesus. God is so good, church. He is uh, so marvelous, so awesome. He's so uh, timely, kind, loving, patient, giving, blessing, anointing, covering, guiding, directing. He's just all in all. And that's who our master is. He's the best of the best, and there is no one that compares. Uh, he created us. We did not create him. And today, I just want to give him all praise and glory and accolade. Because, um, to be honest with you, it doesn't even feel like my conference it feels like our conference. I don't, <clears throat> I don't make much effort for this to take place, but I see such a value in you. <clears throat> You're worth doing this. <coughs> and when God showed me that uh, he wanted to cause this a conference to become a time of awakening. He spoke that to me last year. And uh, as we saw the development of the transformation in our nation and the world through this uh, uh, virus that came in and just caused such havoc and fear. Fear was the backbone behind this virus. And fear is the item that strived to stop us from becoming who we should be as men and women of God, church, servants, and even just citizens. Not just the citizens of heaven, us, but the citizens of the world as well. And so with this happening, God began to show me. He said, son, we need to bring an awakening to the body of Christ. And uh, we wrestled last year to make the conference become what it did. And uh, this year, God just uh, encouraged me that this is going to happen without any failure, and it's just going to come on and occur and become what it's been designed to be. And then he, I began to speak to him and said, God, what are you talking about? Awakening, time of awakening, and this is what he put in me, and we went to Ephesians chapter 5, and this is where God began to show me what he really meant. And I'm going to ask you to turn there. But before we do, I want to thank all of you workers. Thank you. Thank you. All of the performances that took place, the singers, the worshipers, the specials, the dance, dance diversity, Rhea. And just everybody that was up here in the different churches throughout the state of Colorado, it was you. The MCs, those attendants that took care of the little things that we don't sometimes recognize. These ushers, the people that took up the offering and the people that uh, were the ones that uh, gave information about how to give, what to give, why to give. And this has been a great success. Pastor Joe Weidinger said, this is the best. His wife Becky said, it just keeps going, increasing into something better. But the difference with this conference, and I don't compare ourselves to other conferences 
is this is family. Yeah. Really is. Yeah. And, uh, and it's something that we feel at home. We're brothers and sisters in the Lord. And when you come in and no one's recognized you, then uh, we haven't accomplished and did what we should do. We want you to know that you're loved, you're cared for, you're important, and you're worth every bit of what we're doing here. And uh, this isn't for us to be patted on the back. It's to speak into you, bless you, help you, give you insight, encourage you, give you guidance, direction, build you up, strengthen you. Give you that push forward for 2021 because 2021 is going to be a dynamic year. Don't kid yourself. It's not over. This is the middle. And from here, we see that at the end, God is going to usher some things in. I've been believing for this reviving movement of the Holy Ghost for years. And now I see us getting to the peak of the hill where God is going to begin to cause a develop, development and a movement that is going to encourage, strengthen, and bless us. I see men and women coming out of the woodwork saying, can I be a part? Can I follow? Can I lead? Can I guide? Can I help? What can I do to become a vital part of the kingdom of God. That's what's happening. They're coming from everywhere. And I'll be showing that a little bit at the end. But I want you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And I want to kind of just give you some thought on what I see in this verse 13 and 14. I know we've... Uh, uh, Beat it until the horse is dead. But that's okay, because all of us that have been up here, we all have a different sight on it. And what I want to bring to you tonight is the light and darkness. That's what I want you to see. And these men that preached about the light, that preached about the Hebraic word that gave us guidance and, and speaking about how light we operate in because he is in us. Just so much depth of direction. I'll never be able to measure to these men that have expressed this, but what I want to do is give you some simple flavors of what God is showing me. Let's go there. Ephesians chapter 5, time of awakening. Verse 13, but all things that are exposed. Okay, let's look at that. All things that are exposed. When you are exposed, it's like I have, I was fortunate enough to get a really nice room this time. Uh, we got a suite. And in the suite, you come in, there's a living room. And I remember I got a suite last year for Coney and, and his wife. And he said, this is awesome, Mike. And, and his wife, Lanny, told me, I hate you. I said, why? He said, because now Coney's telling me, you go in the other room. I'm going to relax here. <laughs> and it, it, it's like, Lanny, I'm sorry. Next time, I won't get you a suite. But we got a suite, and you come in, there's a living room. There's a couch and a, and a table and kind of like a living room setting. Then you go around the corner, and there's a bedroom. Then you go back into the bathroom, there's this shower, really cool shower. I don't have one of them. It's plexiglass all the way around. Some of you may have that kind of shower, but it's real thick plexiglass. And then you go back, and there's the toilet. It's another door to close you off while you're doing your makeup. <laughs> and it's got two sinks. So it's really a beautiful setup, and the double tree really took good care of Josie and I. Oh, yeah. But 
you go into the shower and there's no door. You walk in and it's just a doorway. I said, where's the curtain? Where's the sliding door? Where's the barn door? And it's just open. So when I, I'm thinking, okay, who's going to take a shower first? And I'm thinking about being exposed. Here you are, you're in this shower, and, you know, I ain't got the Hulk body anymore. <laughs> you know, I got pimples all, dimples all over. And I ain't the most masculine guy anymore. I acted, but I'm not. Josie can push me over and I'll fall. But we're walking, holding on with each other. But here the shower is, there's no door. Now, a guy like David Tejinera, you know, he'd get in there and Salute to me, Linda. <laughs> you know, he's all good looking, strong. Gabriel, too. But you got these, these guys that just, they're fit for that kind of a shower. <laughs> but the Word of God says, but all things that are exposed. And so we're getting exposed. And my wife says, everybody out of the apartment, I'm going to take a shower. She don't want nobody, she don't even want me there. <laughs> so I'm waiting to have a cup of coffee while she, the point is, church, is that what God is saying is that you're exposed. I'm exposed. All things are exposed. There is no uh, Changing, transforming, hiding, pretending. It's exposed. So he says that, and this is what I'm seeing. And then he says, are made manifest by the light. Manifest by the light. Manifest means that everything is seen from the front, the back, the side, the top, the bottom everything. It's like going into an airport and getting checked to see if you have anything illegal on you. You go through and they make you stand there. You put your arms up like this and that thing goes in a circle around you. And then you come out. This is the way that light is. Now let's go to light. As church we face the world. Our call and place is to do the will of God. You have to find out personally what His will is for you. We need to know the will of God. You better start searching for His will. What is His will for you? What has He called you to be and do and become? What is it that God is manifesting inside of us with this light? And He says this, and when we look at the light, light's purpose is to expose darkness. And remove it. We know that. The minute light comes in, darkness is gone. Oh, there are shadows. Like the word of, of God says, shadows of things to come. But those shadows are visible. And the light's exposure, its true purpose. Light is an electromagnetic radiation. Do you know that? It's electromagnetic. So when you look at that, it goes much deeper than just a bright bulb or just the sun. It's something that radiates in you and through you. So when you are a light, 
you are a radiant carrier of that light. So when you walk into any position or place, God is going to use you to expose whatever darkness is there so that it could come to the forefront and become a part of the exposure that the light is trying to bring out. God's exposing you, church. God's wanting you to see who you really are. He's not there to try and destroy you. He's there to cleanse you. This light is for cleaning purposes. This electromagnetic radiation can be detected by the human eye. Now, when I was younger, I was going to be an optician. And so becoming an optician, you have to learn about the light. You have to learn about the color scheme. You have to learn what it is that light is and how is it that we have color. How is it that we can look and see these different colors? How is it that we are able to see just light and just dark? I want to walk you through this because I want you to understand the uh, action of Jesus Christ and how his light radiates through us to expose the sin of the world. The sin does not understand us. It does not comprehend us. But our purpose is to begin to let that darkness be exposed so that it could become transforming and powerful. But let's look at it. Light travels at 186,000 Miles per second. Second, church, not miles. 186,000 miles in one second. <coughs> what is that saying to you? Think about it. That means that when that sun comes up, that light... 186,000 miles in one second, it moves. So if light has that capacity to move at that speed, what is Jesus capable of? Whoa. He is so exposing that there is nothing, nothing, my friend, Nothing that can harm you because of the exposing power of Christ of darkness to say, be gone, dark, and let my purity of light come in and transform everything that surrounds the child of God. Why do we have angels, church? Angels are beings that have been created by God that are messengers and ministers. That's their only purpose. And to glorify the I am. But us, angels, I believe, church, are jealous of us. The Bible indicates that to a degree. When they look at us, they are perplexed and confounded by our actions of God's purity and God himself. How can you treat God in such a manner and yet you're higher than me? So Satan understands the purposes of light, and he 
is so viciously angry and wants so badly to destroy and stop you and draw you into darkness that he'll do anything he can. He'll whisper to you. He'll tell you things that aren't true. He'll lie. Guess what? Satan is the daddy of liars. That doesn't mean he has the biggest lie. That means he's the creator of lie. And his purpose is what he did in the garden. I'm going to get to that in a little bit. And I don't want to prolong my word this evening, but I want to get across to you the anointed, blessed power of who Jesus really is. And guess what? He's in us. He, this light resides in you. There's nobody that is a child of God that does not have this anointing. But we misunderstand the activity of the Spirit of God as He functions through us. We do not truly see and understand His anointing and power. I believe that God wants to work through all of us in such a fashion that we can begin to see this world transformed. And guess what? I believe with all my heart that that time is coming near. We will see a great awakening. This awakening, when it comes out, you, as a light bearer, are going to operate in such a fashion that people around you will be transformed in an instant. My word to you, if you have someone in your life that has just so much difficulty and they're so uh, uh, mixed up and misdirected, that you begin to pray that God would have an encounter with them. God encounter is their only answer. You can, you can quote all the trickery. You can state all of the accolade. You can uh, butter up, flour up, and get ready and powder up as much as you care to and can. But until they have a God encounter with that light that travels 186,000 miles a second, and guess what? That is just the created light. The sun was put in this solar system by the anointed hand of God, and it didn't even burn him. So God's the one that created this powerful entity called the sun that makes light travel through it 186,000 miles in a second. And he is the true light. And that true light is in you. Let's go a little further. You know that man basically can run 28 miles an hour. 20, that's fast, too. I could probably run six. And, and to walk, walk three hours, and you'll get, never mind. You'll get tired. The land speed record is 763 miles an hour. Isn't that fast? On land, I mean, think about it. Most jets are probably going uh, 350 to 450 miles an hour, something in that range. And a land speed record, 700 miles an hour? That thing, church, has to begin to start creeping upward when you're going that fast. But the whole idea behind it 
is that that's nothing compared to the light. And that's just us, humans. With all of this, the fastest record of the jet propulsion moving is 2,100 miles an hour. That's astounding. In one hour, it can travel 2,000 miles. Okay, so we've got all those statistics. And it gives us a clear idea of the power of light. That's just natural light. Now, I want to go into when I was becoming an optician, we had to uh, remember the light color spectrum. What it is, church, is it's there's seven colors in the light spectrum. And those seven colors are in the rainbow. God is so magnificent that he designed this light spectrum to be those seven colors, and they're all in the rainbow. And when you train to be an optician, you have to understand the shadows, the lights, the darkness, the open uh, brightness, etc. And you have to understand this color. It's red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet. That's what the color spectrum is. Now think about that. Roy, R-O-Y, B. Roy, R-O-Y, green, B-I-V. So the way that you would train you is you would learn those, those alphabetical settings and then you would understand and, the, and they begin to try and explain to you the purposes behind it, okay? I don't want to wear you out with that. But check this out. When you think about those colors and you think about what's not included here is white and black, okay? That's not in the color spectrum. When we see light, what it is, is all the spectrums of light together, okay? So all those colors, they come together, and then you see light white. Now, when we look at that and we see dark, okay, check out the dark. When we see black, this means that all of the colors of the light spectrum or the color spectrum, all of them have been absorbed. So church, the devil even understands the rainbow spectrum and in order to shut off Christ, in your life, he wants to remove every valuable item that you have in your spirit and shut you off. And when he does that and when he closes you off to the light, he's got you. Why do they have bars with dimmed lights? Who was it? Somebody had said that uh, you're not only in, in the bar and you're not only there in the dark, you got sunglasses on. You're a cool foo. <laughs> How in the world do you sit there with these sunglasses on and these guys that wear them or girls, whatever, you know they don't see a thing. Those are the easiest ones to punch out. Because they cannot see your hand coming. So you say, 
hey, bro, I got some glasses. You want to wear them? And then you hit him. <laughs> but the, the idea is, is darkness operates in such a foolish way, but we get sucked into it and become absorbed all our brightness, all of our love, all of our anointing, all of our greatness that it resides inside of us because of Jesus Christ is shut off. That is why the devil wants to suck you into drugs, alcohol, all of these things that are going to cause you to lose sight of the bright light of Christ so that he can destroy you and sucker punch you. He wants to wipe us out, church. So, with all of that coming together, the Lord's promise, church, is the rainbow and his warning is the darkness. Look what he says in John 8, 12. Then Jesus spoke to them again, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me shall not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. That's a very powerful word. Because what he's saying is that when you walk with him, Jesus Christ, you have the light. Not just the light, but the light of life. So wherever you operate and work and walk in, you have this light in you. But it's not just a brightness. It's an entity that changes people. It begins to transform people. And you need to begin to recognize those little things that you see. All of a sudden, you see somebody have a need. You go by them or to them, and that light, what it does is it absorbs that darkness and begins to cause something to occur between you, the light of Jesus Christ inside you, and them, the darkness of the world that is around them. So if you are wise enough and you recognize that they need the light, you'll penetrate them, you'll begin to speak to them, you'll drop something in them about the Lord, and before you know it, they get set free. Today, I went to uh, Pastor uh, Randy Mickey's room, and his grandson was sick with a fever. And he called me. He said, would you come and, and uh, pray for my grandson? So I went there, and I prayed for him, and he had this high fever. And it was darkness, church. Not in their room, not them. But darkness was trying to absorb this little boy's body. And so what I did was I just went and laid hands on him. And I trusted the light. And I spoke into him. And I spoke this sickness out. And he's here today and he's back to normal. Because of the light that is in me, it wasn't me. It was the training of the light that absorbed that dark matter in that little boy's brain, and it began to get sucked out because of the power of Jesus Christ working in that little boy's life. Psalms 119, 105 says this, Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. So, what do we do? Many times we ignore the power of this, but he's telling you that his word, so when you voice this uh, uh, book, the voice of God, when you voice it, what it becomes is a lamp. His voice will light your way to change lives wherever you go. But he goes further and he says, 
and a light to my path. So what he's going to teach you is where to go, how to go, and why to go, and what you're going to. The Word will guide you in that. I absorb the Word of God. I love the Word of God. I breathe the Word of God. And the reason I do is because I understand that this voice of God begins to change whatever circumstance I'm in, and it begins to change the lives of people that surround me. My grandson, he's a warrior. And he knows how to pray. He's nine years old and he speaks in tongues with power and anointing. He gets there and he begins to, I begin to train him. I speak into him. I tell him, son, you can't let this anxiety overcome you. And I train and teach him. I say, anxiety is fear. And what fear does is it darkens your light. And so what you have to do is begin to battle this fear and say, fear, you're a liar. You're death and be gone. I put you back into the pit of hell. And I said, now start speaking in tongues. And he begins to get down and says, oh, sarembe, si, bo, bo, bo. Ayende behei, sambasero, bo, 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 and God begins to move through that little nine-year-old boy, and people get healed, lives get changed, because that light that is residing in him springs out and changes every circumstance that he prays for. I've seen grown-ups get healed because he's prayed for them. I use him all the time. Church. If that's true, we need to utilize God's voice and speak it forth. That light, the voice light, comes out and begins to do something that you're not able to do and I'm not able to do. But it, it's residing in you, though. You walk in it. Ephesians 5.14 says this. Therefore, he says, awake you who sleep. Arise from the dead, and Christ will give you light. Think about that, church. Wake up. How many of you have ever gone on a long drive? And when you go on a long drive, have you ever gotten sleepy? And, and your wife or your husband knocks you upside your head and says, Awake. You, you need to pull over. Me, when I drive, we go through Denver, and I get to Castle Rock, and she tells me, you got to pull over. <laughs> Castle Rock's 30 miles away. I just cannot drive uh, long distances anymore. It's not because I'm old. It's just that I only get four and five hours of sleep a night. That's why. Pat me on the back. The point being, church, is that we need to awake. He says, awake you who sleep. Who's that? Are you sleeping, brother? Are you sleeping, sister? What are you doing? He's telling us, that what we do is we lose focus by not utilizing the brightness of the light, the Word of God, and studying it and making it a daily practice, not a religious practice. When you make it a daily practice, what you're doing is you now are beginning to be word diggers. You're beginning to absorb that word, letting that word speak out to you, gaining revelation, 
seeing a transformation. Your teaching begins to change. Your understanding begins to increase. And you begin to walk in a new power and a new authority. And before you know it, you're walking and you're seeing people and saying to them things that you otherwise would not have said because you're absorbing the light and you're walking with this word and it's causing you to wake up. And then he says, arise from the dead. That's heavy. Why does God say that? We know that Paul wrote that, but God's the one that spoke through Paul, and he penned that by the Holy Ghost. But why did he call us dead? You know why, church? He calls us dead because we lose sight of the light. We lose sight of the word. We lose sight of who Christ is. And we begin to put our sight on us, on circumstances, on people, on individuals, on whatever it is. We put our focus on something instead of looking in the word and saying, where's the answer, God? What is the answer? And me, I always utilize my thesaurus. I'm always trying to find how I can best describe the situation through the Word of God and pull it out, find Scripture that best benefits me in that situation, speak that Scripture forth, and God begins to transform the area and situation I'm coming up against. That is utilizing His light and the Word. Amen? I've said that many times through the years. But you sometimes don't put it to good use. And God's wanting you to start utilizing that ability to find every situation you face in the Word of God. Do you realize that that's in there? Every situation you face is in His Word. But you've got to find it. So you must be diggers of the word. And being a digger of the word means that you're going to pull out of that word uh, information by using a thesaurus, which is a book that gives you different pieces of words for the same meaning. Understand? Don't look at me like a bunch of cows. Respond. I, you don't have to cheer me. I'm just trying to get to you that, like, uh, uh, when you see the word dumb, and you know that it can also be dumber, or it can be stupid, or it can be ridiculously stupid, <laughs> or whatever. That's what a thesaurus does, is it brings a word that doesn't match up with dumb. So that you can now go into the Word of God with that Word and find it and begin to pull scriptures out that are in that concordance and say, oh, that one fits my situation. Okay? My church knows this, but you need to know it also. Our purpose is to bring the light to the world. Agreed? We must bring it. God first called forth the light in the beginning. We know that. And God called the light day and the darkness night. And when you look that up, what day is, is a divisional tool. That's what God was meaning when he said the light day. It's a division of time. It's a division of situations. It's a divisional tool that God utilized, and he wanted man to understand that. So you have morning, noon, and night. 
And that's what God was trying to convey to us when he called it day. Now look at this, John chapter 3. I want you to read this with me. Verses 19 through 21 as I get near my final thoughts. And it says this, And this is the judgment. The light has come into the world. Pick up judgment. This is the judgment. That's interesting. Because what God is saying is that the minute the light came into the world, judgment came and it began to parch truth and lie, right and wrong. That's what its purpose was. The light has come into the world and people loved the darkness rather than the light because their works were evil. Now, when you love darkness, it's not necessarily that you're making out with darkness. It's not that you're, oh, I love you, darkness. Come to me, my darkness. That's not what's being said here, okay? It's more a statement of we can hide from the light and not be exposed so we begin to fall in love with that cover so that God can no longer see what we're doing. But as children of God, with the light in us, we understand that he sees everything. But a sinner doesn't understand that. So when you come around, that's why you're so disdained and hated and disliked because now you expose truth and they don't like that. So what our purpose is, is to be exposers. And it says further, for everyone who does wicked things, hates the light and does not come to the light lest his works should be exposed. So what happens to a backslider is they begin to pull away from the light. And how do they do that? Simple. They stop reading their word. They stop praying. They stop exercising the gifts that God has given them. Then comes my second part. Darkness comes in and overwhelms you. My final observation. In this world, church, we're facing a dilemma. We know this. And what it is, is the enemy is trying to absorb our light. He'll COVID us. We even get comfortable and say, shoot. One of the brothers said it. I think he was wearing his cojones or, and, you know, suit up here. I think it was Reggie. Pastor Reggie, where are you? Was it you that was wearing your underwear and, and you were dressed to preach? Why wasn't you? It was Ernest. Was it you, Ernest? Whoever it was, that's starting to get too comfortable. What I'm saying simply, okay, is that then we begin to say, man, I love this. I did. I said it. And I begin to broadcast as a shoot. I could broadcast whenever I wanted, dressed from the waist down however I wanted. And so, this darkness began to absorb me. And the enemy started to take precedent when we began to just do video. We no longer had to get up in the morning. We no longer even had to get out of bed to pray. We just 
Thank you, Jesus, for this food. Amen. You could even eat in the bed because you didn't have to work because you were getting your, your dole check from the government. They were making it so easy for us. Not everybody, but most of us. And so we just went along to get along. That is absorbing our life. And so what this snake, the Leviathan, began to do is he began to coil us. And we began to get so comfortable that we lost sight of what our true call was. And not just the shepherds. You're not getting away with it, you parishioners. You were just digging it as well. And a lot of you stopped reading your words, stopped praying. Oh, you'd write on Facebook, yeah, I was praying six hours today because I was in the COVID. Yeah, praying six hours after every snore. The point is, church, is this thing began to coil around us, cause us to lose sight, and make us ineffective. Then his trickery took place in the people that had that, that tinge of fear. Fear began to become bigger. We began to wear masks. And then we didn't even want to shake hands. I was freaking out with handshaking because I'm an OCD kind of guy. I got to be clean. My, you know what I'm saying? And then this began to make even the dirty people OCD'd. <laughs> you know, some of you were like, praise the Lord, brother. Because you know now that boy ain't taking a bath for days. So I ain't going to his house. I'll call him on the Internet. What I'm saying, church, is we all freaked out, lost sight of our true calling. And sure, we, some of us prayed. Some of us got strong in prayer. Some of us didn't. But it doesn't matter. The point being is that this Leviathan that I think is the uh, power of the world today began to wrap itself around the church and choked it out because men and women of God stopped praying as much. Men and women of God stopped reading as much. Men and women of God stopped doing as much because we had these dilemmas of fear and uh, trying to follow the law and trying to do righteously so we believed and we became inept and inadequate. Now we're coming out of COVID, but they're trying to bring on a new COVID, COVID-2. You can take your COVID-2, and I'll tell you what to do with it. I'm not afraid. If I die, shoot, I'm in better place now, baby. Oh, if I get sick, I'll get a bunch of people crying for me, uh, you know, coming and watching me through the window. We love you, and they're gone. My wife ain't getting out of the house much, so she for sure ain't going to be there. She'll be text messaging me with those little emojis. <laughs> Church, we need to break loose. We need to stop the Leviathan from operating in the fashion that he has. This absorbing devil wants to absorb our Christianity. I believe we're facing a Leviathan church 
that is out to choke out all our ability to show the light. And we must fight back. But you're not going to win anything if you do nothing. It's time for us to rise up and begin to understand what we're facing. I want you to look as I get near my clothes at Job. I want you to turn to Job chapter 41. And let's look at this quickly. What Job 41 does in the first eight verses, he says this. And, and God is talking to Job. And God is trying to wake Job up to some truth. Because Job has gotten into a slump. But I could never be a Job. Job is much greater than a man like me. But he says this. God tells him, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook? Or snare his tongue with a line which you lower? Can you put a reed through his nose or pierce his jaw with a hook? Will he make many supplications to you? Will he speak softly to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Will you take him as a servant forever? Will you play with him as with a bird? Or will you leash him as for your maidens? Will, you, uh, will your companions make a banquet of him? Will they apportion him among the merchants? Can you fill his skin with harpoons or his head with fishing spears? Lay your hand on him. Remember the battle and never do it again. Whew. Remember the battle and never do it again. God is telling us, let's not go back to COVID. Sure, there might be compliances. I know that I may have to get a shot if I go to Africa in April and I'm planning on going, I'll take the shot so that I could do the work of the Lord. It doesn't matter. But the point being is if I don't need the shot, I'm not taking the shot. Now, I'm not trying to get you to run with me, okay, in regard to that. You must do what you must do. It's not going to make you a sinner or filthy if you take the shot or you don't take the shot. Don't worry about that. That's semantics. What you focus on, church, is not going back to what you were and start standing against this spirit called Leviathan that is full of fear and wants to freeze us in the movement of the kingdom of God. Time of awakening. Time to wake up. Time to do something. Time to stand. God is telling us not to touch the darkness. He's telling us, don't go backwards, go forward and upward. If you remember and never allow it to affect you again, church, the Leviathan desires to choke out our light this is why the Lord warns us to keep our vessels full of oil. You must be a full vessel child of God. That oil must be filled up inside of you. You must have that wick trimmed. And what that simply means, Holy Ghost, word. Simple. I want to close with this. Luke 11.34 says this. The lamp of the body is the eye. Therefore, when your eye is good, your whole body also is full of light. So we have to change our vision and we have to change our action. But he says this, then he warns us, but when your eye is bad, your body is full of darkness. The python is trying to squeeze out 
our ability to pray, our ability to fast. I said fast. Amen. Our ability to call on God like men in days of old. Be aware that this is a time of awakening and let your eyes open to what the enemy is about to do. I want to seal this up right now. I got this book. It's called The Spirit of Python by Jensen Franklin. And I want to read a couple of things that he says really powerful. He says, you feel as if something has crept in slowly but surely and stolen your zeal for praising and worshiping God to the point that there just doesn't seem to be any time for any more for it anymore do you feel limited hindered stifled and unproductive do you feel that have you felt that that is python upon your life then he goes on to say our enemy is dangerous he's not playing around he has one agenda to steal, kill, and destroy those of us trying to accomplish God's plan. And he knows that if we're not diligent, he can creep in slowly through access we've granted to him. Have you granted anything to the devil? How we grant it is we just comply to what we're watching and what we're doing. And, and it goes further on, paralyze our ability to pray and worship God and eventually choke out our spiritual lives all together. In closing, I want you to follow this. Very powerful. And this is who we are. In Topeka, Kansas in 1900, Students at Charles Parham's Bethel Bible School begin to discuss whether the Holy Spirit could still come like a mighty rushing wind and fill people, causing them to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. It didn't matter if they were in geometry class or English class. The topic always turned to this subject. Finally, the hunger became so intense that they declared a fast for the close of 1900 going in to the new year, 1901. They agreed to fast and pray for God to fill them with the same Holy Spirit power that they read about in Acts chapter 2. This is exactly what a group of 34 students did. And on New Year's Day, 1901, suddenly there came a wind from elsewhere. At first, it hit a young woman who began speaking in Chinese. And soon, the wind from elsewhere blew on the rest of the group. They spoke in at least 21 uh, known languages that were verified by native speakers who turned up at many of the meetings. These events became known as the Topeka Outpouring. But that was just the beginning. In 1905, a former slave named Lucy Farrow spent two months with Charles Parham's family in Topeka. Farrow was leading a small holiness church in Houston, Texas. Texas and was hungry for an Acts 2 encounter with God. She left a man named William J. Seymour in charge of her Houston flock. While she was in her, on her quest to Topeka, the Parham family followed Lucy back to Houston, Texas, where Charles set up a Bible school very similar to Bethel in Topeka. Seymour, who had been on his own quest for an encounter with the Holy Spirit, attended Parham's Bible school in Houston, and by early 1906, Seymour accepted an invitation to lead a congregation 
in Los Angeles, California. Although he still had not personally had an experience of speaking in tongues, he was profoundly affected by the teaching of Parham. And upon arriving in Los Angeles, he began to preach about the power of the Holy Spirit in speaking in tongues. When the doors of his congregation meeting place were padlocked shut, he began to fast and pray, hoping he would experience a powerful spiritual encounter. Hours turned into days, and others began to join join him in this vigil. At one such prayer meeting, Edward Lee, a janitor at a local bank and a tender of Seymour's church, had a powerful vision of Peter and Paul shaking under the power of the Holy Ghost. After he shared this vision with the prayer group, Seymour laid his hands on his friend to pray for him. Lee's legs buckled, and down to the ground he went. Seymour knew something profound had just begun. A wind from elsewhere began to blow. Bring the wind, God. Seymour continued to fast and pray, and soon relocated his congregation to 312 Azusa Street in Los Angeles. A revival broke out that went on day and night for three and a half years. People came from all over the world, and the modern-day Pentecostal movement was birthed out of that wind from elsewhere that started at 312 Azusa Street. Several major denominations with churches around the world are in existence today as a result of Seymour's prevailing prayer and fasting for a wind from elsewhere. Church, are we hungry for that wind from elsewhere? Do we desire that wind from elsewhere? So as a preacher who knows all about the Holy Spirit outpouring that began on Azusa Street, it took on a whole different meaning for me. When I read the newspaper article about the expert uttering the words to the city officials in Los Angeles, what you really need is a wind from elsewhere. We need to go to the mayors of our cities and begin to tell them, What you need is a wind from elsewhere. We need to go to our congregations and begin to spread. What we need is a wind from elsewhere. It's time, my friend, to gain and experience the wind from elsewhere. I wish I could have been at that meeting when the expert announced this to the mayor of Los Angeles. I would have stood up and said, Sir, I can take you to a place in Los Angeles where the wind came. And if you can tap into this wind, it will sweep the gangs out of Los Angeles. It will sweep prostitution out. It will clean up Hollywood. It will clean up our nation. What America needs is a wind from elsewhere. It can clean your city from gangs, drugs, child abuse, murders from all other sin problems for which, where, for which there is no earthly solution. Church, we need a wind from elsewhere that comes from the light of the living God. We need to cry out to the master of masters. Oh, God, give us the wind. Give us the wind. Give us the wind. Oh, church, I believe that this is a time of awakening. You are now challenged. The gauntlet has dropped. It is time for you and I to go to our churches, to go to our loved ones, 
to go to our houses and begin to call out on the Almighty for the wind from elsewhere. Church, we can see it happen in the Pacific Northwest. We can see it happen in the California mountains. We could see it happen in Denver, Colorado, Pueblo, Colorado, Aurora. We could see it happen in Westminster, Wee Ridge, Kansas, wherever you're from. We need that win, church. But we're not going to attain it by just shouting and screaming. We must take seriously the word that God is giving us today. It is a time of awakening. Oh, church, will you rise up together with me and my wife, Josie, and begin to go home after this conference and call out to the wind from elsewhere?